Friday, the 18th of uh, September. Let's wrap up the Business and Markets Week on the African continent or here on Frontier Opening Bell. Welcome my guest, Ayodhi Jebo, who is an investment professional and is uh, 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 sharing some of the market top stories within the Nigeria space for us this morning. Good morning, Ayodhi. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much. Let's just quickly go through the uh, uh, African markets for, the, for yesterday, Thursday. Not a particularly positive day. South Africa fell a massive 1.65%. Kenya was down 06 The Egyptian market softened 0.34%. The Ivorian market managed to sidestep that 0.32% because of gains by heavy names in the financial services such as Society General Bank. And then the Nigerian market also softened 0.07%. It's been a negative trading week for the Nigerian boss. In East Africa, some of the big stories around the uh, revision to the Kenya's uh, GDP is expected to rebound in Q4 by food exports. Uh, KPLC, which is the Kenya, Kenya Power, says its 2019-2020 full year revenue dropped by 37.2 billion shillings. That's a massive decline because of the energy debt. Meantime, we have Ethiopia spending 10.5 billion shillings to print new notes. That's about $37 million to mitigate the impact of uh, counterfeiters and illegal financial flows. But the top story, as you can see there, is Uganda, Rwanda, and Tanzania says they're setting up a single electronic stock market by, in the region in East Africa by the end of this year. That takes Kenya out of the story. How do you intend to go about it? We'll continue to follow that development very closely. But let's look at the Nigerian uh, market where we are finishing up this week. The central bank grants license to Greenwich Trust to operate as a merchant bank. That's a, a new development for these uh, investment and securities firm that's been on Broad Street for a number of years. We are in the, so in the season of earnings forecast within the Nigeria space, MRS says 125.39 billion naira will be its revenue in the first quarter, fourth quarter of the year, October to December, but net profit will just be slightly above 1 billion, US, 1 billion local currency. Flamius reported to the market yesterday the appointment of Jumia's chairman, Juliet Anama, as a member of the board of directors. In Ghana, the oil company posted 105.5 million shillings profit after tax for last year, and in Cote d'Ivoire, Total, uh, say Spain shareholders on September 25, 113.5 uh, CFA uh, franc as uh, uh, dividend per share for the year ended. Ayodeji, Ebo, talk to us about this new development. We appreciate your coming through on the program as well. Luke Ofojebe from Vetiba Capital. Good morning. Good morning, Boston. Thank you for having me today. Good. Thank you so much. Ayodeji, quickly, let's hear from you on this market development for this week for Nigeria. You see the Greenish Trust uh, licensing as uh, deepening the market? Yes. Um, thank you for having me. And um, it's interesting that um, we're also we're seeing uh, more licenses being issued within the merchant bank space. And uh, for Greenwich, I think it's also a very positive one. Uh, this it co coincides with the 25 25th year anniversary this for this year and when you see the major challenge we are having in, in nigeria it's still um financing so for well, and you look at one merchant bank where they they are more into to the corporate space so they don't take retail deposit minimum deposit is 50 million and what i i believe the company will also try to do not to just join the um join the bad wagon they would also try to see how they can carve a niche for themselves look at the sector where they feel they can develop ex expertise and they can channel fund and develop and support especially within the real sector um, we all know that um, in line with what the cbn is looking at uh, trying to drive loan into the real sector um, what this um, brings on the table for greenwich is that they would also be able to um, supports that real sector uh, for some of their existing clients. Um, now they now have sufficient capital to also support. You know, they've been very strong in investment banking on a lot of transactions. So I believe that it's, um, it's a positive one for, for the investment banking space, a positive one for the 
for the CBN is also a positive one for for the Nigerian economy as a whole. And we'll see how um, event unfolds um, as we progress. Then also um, touching on the MRS, um, which operates within the downstream sector, you would um, um, notice that recently um, the PPRK, PPPRA is trying to is trying to abolish the uh, price modulation and. Um, uh, prices of uh, uh, of PMS will be subject to um, demand and, and supply, but still there's a downside risk uh, or um, downside risk for most of the most of the players within this space because of the FX liquidity. So for NMPC may be getting it at the official rate to bring in products, while for the independent marketers may have to resort to the um, black markets, which is has almost over 15 naira spread. So um, we are not surprised that the pro profit uh, projection is marginal. It's still a very tough um, terrain for, for them. So it's going to be a huge turnover. That's a massive figure, but the profit margin, when we look at that forecast, it looks like operating costs and other uh, costs uh, just wiped out almost the entire revenue that they are making. Maybe this will happen to yeah. the rest of the other players within that space as well. Yes, um, you know, even if you look at, even beyond um, the current challenges, um, when you look at margin level within the downstream oil and gas space, most times it's always in single digits. Um, mm. It's because they, they carry very high cost and even the spread or, that they make is also very minimal um, per liter because you see, for it's only for some of them that are diversified, like the likes of Total, Mobile, they are into real estate, but if we, if we are strictly um, into the downstream that you, mm -hmm. you take um, products and you sell, white labor products and white products rather, and you sell, then the, the margin is always very thin because the cost is very significant and it's still controlled. And because it's also a very competitive market, you can't just charge, people who drive to filling stations that, are, that will sell at the cheapest rate for them. But mm -hmm. it's good, like, you know, what we have within the, diesel space that's very and anyone can bring in diesel and it's very there will be price discovery as we as we progress yes um prices will vary across different regions in nigeria based on um the cost of moving those products but i feel that um go, the government has also seen that they really don't have any choice now because um their revenue is very constrained and even if they look at the impact of the subsidy, they pay over one trillion naira on subsidy every year. And we really, yes, when you say it really doesn't go and impact the the low income earners, because even for when we say the poor, the poor cannot even afford to even buy motorcycles. So they really don't benefit from this, and that's why I think um, the go government has realized that it's better. Now, I think part of what they did was they didn't waste the prices when prices were low. They tried to adopt that price modulation. So it didn't start. So they it came down to like 124, 125. And you see on a month of month going mm -hmm. up. So each time now, our hearts will keep beating once we see crude oil prices. We pray. So now we don't know what to pray for. Is it to pray that oil prices <laughs> move to hundred dollars per barrel and we start paying three hundred sure. naira per sure. liter? <laughs> so it's a chicken and egg situation. But yes, that, that that takes us to the need for local refining, isn't it? Look of Ojibwe, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So um, clearly, we need to start oh. refining food in Nigeria, and yeah. that's what Dangote is now planning to do. He's been working mm. on the refinery um, since he mentioned it in 2016. Mm. We've seen a significant level of progress um, at the site where the refinery is being constructed. But trying to be realistic, I think um, the completion of the refinery might take up to um, the next four years, maybe 2024, before we see it coming on stream. So till then, Nigeria will still remain um, dependent on the import of um, PMS into the country. And of course, um, we understand that right now, um, the government is trying to adopt a more liberal market in the downstream segment where um, forces of demand and supply can determine market prices. But of mm -hmm. course, we still have, um, um, the market is not com completely frictionless. We still have um, some sort of friction in some places. So for instance, we still have the FX situation 
um, because of the fact that effect supply is still limited, a number of these um, oil marketers um, at the moment think it's, it's more profitable to buy PMS directly from the NNPC. So at the moment, NNPC mm. is still the only importer of PMS. So you can see that's a friction on its own. If you want to really adopt a Libra market, that shouldn't be the case. But at the moment, it's, it's what it is. And I think, I, I think that's what it's still going to be um, um, for some months to come till we see improvements in FX supply. And not just improvements in FX supply, stability in FX. Uh, so given this, um, mm. what you said about MRS, um, of course, we expect revenue to grow. Um, because uh, market prices, we continue to cont uh, we continue on that top trend, given the improvements we are seeing in oil prices. However, margins might not improve significantly from what we saw last year, um, due to the fact that um, we still have this um, and then, um, the oil marketers depending on NMPC for the supply of PMS, so their cost of sales might still be pressured um, in the interim. So we might not see improvements in their Profit or uh, in their profitability from the um, for the remainder of the year. Thank mm. you. It's going to be very interesting moving forward. Uh, it, uh, it's it's just going to be a, a work in progress as we, as we see it. Like you rightly put it, perhaps before the Dangote refinery is back, if we can really maybe lay government's hands off the refineries and allow private operators to come in, maybe those existing refineries can can function a little bit more optimally. Okay, um, and then perhaps we'll see more improvement in local production, reduce imports, so that at least some of these marketers can, can take products locally without buying them from overseas, and, and then that will, that, that will really uh, uh, help. But again, as I said, like as you said, it's, it's work in progress, by the way. It's not going to be as easy to come down from where we were coming from over a period of 10, 20, 30, 40 years. It's definitely going to be a whole lot of work. Uh, a quick one on the Southern African market. Yesterday was a big day for the SARB, leaving repo rate on change at 3.8%. Forecast the, for the GDP this year will be minus 8.2%, according to the Central Bank Governor Leseja. Previous uh, forecast was about 7.5%, not significantly different, but still below 10%. But the Central Bank of South Africa believes that uh, there will be 39 recovery in the GDP next year and 2.6% a softer size of recovery in 2022. Headline inflation is expected to lower from minus 3.3 uh, to minus 3.3 from minus 3.4. Not significantly different for the year. Yeah. That's the outlook, by the way. And of course, in uh, South Africa's blue label, it says it's selling its uh, uh, assets in Mexico at about 11.5 million uh, US dollars. Capricorn Group, full year 2019-2020, contracted 15.6%. We have our Nigeria's uh, Central Bank Monetary Policy meeting next week, Monday and Tuesday. Two-day meeting, first time since the outbreak of the coronavirus. The previous meetings were one day. Now it's set up for two days. What's your outlook on next week MPC look? Um, so I think it's still going to be status quo. We'll see the MPC um, keeping rates unchanged. Of course, we've seen like... Um, pressure on prices across board. Um, we've seen food inflation rising to 16% according to the last data released by the National Bureau of Statistics. We also saw core inflation rising to a 27-month high of about 10.3%. So we are seeing pressure on different price segments and this, uh, um, this is mainly due to the hike in power tariffs as well as the uptrend we are seeing in fuel prices. And this, uh, um, these price increases have um, featuring through other um, core inflation segments. And um, given this, uh, this increase we are seeing in inflation, typically you will expect um, the MPC to raise rates in a bit to curb the upward movements we are seeing in inflation. But I don't think that will be the case um, because um, we are still dealing with um, recession is already ahead. That's, that's the reality for us. So the expectation is that uh, by the time GDP data for Q3 is released, we'll be seeing another contraction, and that means Nigeria will be slipping into a technical recession. So the CBN at the moment, um, or the MPC in general, um, actually has a pro-growth stance. So we might see them keeping rates on change in order to spur growth in the economy because they want to encourage um, business owners, um, corporations to 
raise debts from um, financial institutions to finance their um, business operations at the moment. So we think um, the CBN, the MPC in general, will continue to lean on that pro-growth stance. Um, so on that basis, I do not think uh, we'll see them raising rates um, uh, at the next um, MPC meeting. At the same time, we don't see them cutting rates uh, uh, because that would be counterintuitive given the upward trend we are seeing in inflation. You don't want to um, worsen the situation where you see inflation rising to about 20, 30 percent because that can just lead to consumer, that can erode consumer spend and even worsen um, the growth you are expecting um, for the economy. So overall, I, I see the MPC maintaining rates at current levels. Okay, interesting what next week will, uh, will look like. But maybe by November, when we see how things uh, are paced out, perhaps we could just say, look, maybe the central bank will sit back throughout the rest of the year and, and just uh, uh, roll along the final four months of 2020. Then we can now have a better outlook uh, into 2021, the, uh, the first MPC will be done in January. We'll, we'll just wait to see how it looks like. But right now, uh, it looks a bit very testy, as you said, uh, to see how rate can't be moved upward or downward. So the best thing is just uh, let's, uh, let's hold things. Inflation, in, outlook on inflation is still uh, very negative, by the way. So it's not uh, anyone's, uh, in anyone's interest right now. You don't want to tick things on the side. But uh, the... Uh, let's look at the North African quickly. We'll take a look at the equity market for the uh, uh, final part of the program. Uh, Egyptian EFG Hems uh, is spinning off its UK solar assets to a Malaysian company. That's uh, for a sizable amount of money. Meantime, Iron and Steel in Egypt reporting 42% loss year on year for full year 2019 2020. Iron and Steel is listed on the Egyptian Stock Exchange. Uh, Bank ABC of Tunisia has appointed two women to lead, uh, to head its uh, operations. That's quite positive for these uh, North African bank institutions. Meantime, the European Investment Bank is putting 200 million euros on the table to support Morocco's agri sector. Look, we need this kind of support for Nigeria's agri sector, isn't it? 200 million euros from the European Investment Bank. If you get that in Nigeria, it will definitely hit some point as far as the agri sector is concerned, isn't it? Definitely. I mean, since the 2016 um, recession, the focus of the government has been on um, diversifying the economy. And clearly, um, one of the strengths um, that the Nigerian economy has is the agricultural sector. Um, there is still a strong um, prospect for growth in that sector. And we've seen the um, government focusing aggressively on that sector. But the major challenge still remains the same. Um, um, one of the major challenges is the fact that liquidity is not really there. So the funding for the sector is not there. We've seen government's revenue drop significantly since the impact of COVID-19. And even before then, 2019 wasn't really a great year for us because if you look at average oil prices, we saw year on year decline in 2020, um, 2019 as well. Um, so that has been impacting the ability of the government to continue to support um, the sector. At the same time, um, we are still dealing with security issues. Um, so Nigerians typically believe that when we don't see reported cases of Hezmen um, clashes, um, Boko Haram, things like this, um, when we don't hear reported cases, we just want to quickly assume that um, um, the Middle Belt, um, the um, Northeast is actually peaceful, but, but that's not the case. Speaking to experts, especially people who have um, businesses, in the middle belt, um, food producing businesses, they still spend a lot on security personnel. And that shouldn't be, that's money that, sh that should directly go into their farming operations, their cattle rearing and the likes, but we still have them spending significant amount of money on security personnel. Um, so these are challenges that will continue to impact um, the cost of um, doing business in the agricultural mm -hmm. sector. So, so, even if, so even if we have something like 200 million euros, for example, uh, to support agriculture, you wouldn't be spending such amount of money to recruit uh, security guards to guard your farms, to guard your poultry or your chickens, whatever, your fish, to guard your workers who are on the farms, as it were, on your processing plant, 
or you want to buy a new generator, by the way, because you don't have power onto where your processing or storage facility were, then the roads as well. So uh, this, as you said, this is still a whole lot of pressure points here for agriculture. So no matter the amount of money we, we pour into this sector, unless we fix agri infrastructure, I guess that's your point. Clearly, clearly, that's that's one of my points. Clearly, and like you mentioned, the infrastructure, the road infrastructure, things like this also need to be put in place before we can actually optimally um, utilize um, that yeah. amount of capital. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, finally, what's your take on uh, this week uh, market so far, and your outlook for next week in one minute? Um, so far in the equity markets, we've seen more of bearish trading. The market has closed down for three consecutive trading sessions. The only time the market closed up um, this week was on Monday. And from what we've seen so far, it looks like the market will extend this um, streak of losses in today's trading session. Uh, we see the banking sector being pressured further. We've been seeing losses in that sector since last week. And we don't think we are going to see any renewed buy side sentiments in today's trading session. So on that basis, we think that um, that losses will extend in today's trading session. However, for the industrial goods, given the fact that their results were uh, better than expected um, in the first half of the year, a number of investors are still betting on, on the companies in that sector releasing um, fantastic results in the second half of the year. So we might continue to see cherry picking on some heavy counters in that sector. Um, for the other sectors like oil and gas, I mean, we've been seeing like a mix um, trading sentiment in the oil and gas. Uh, in the oil market, we've seen Brent recovering slightly to $42 um, compared to a negative trend we saw last week. Um, but despite that, we don't think we'll see any strong buy side sentiment in the um, oil and gas sectors, um, in the oil and gas stocks. Um, given that when you look at what oil prices are doing uh, relative to what they were doing um, um, this time last year, you will notice mm -hmm. that oil prices have declined significantly. So we might continue to see bearish trading on the oil and gas stocks. So given all this, we see the markets um, um, closing negative in today's trading session, and that can lead to a week-on-week -week loss um, for the week. Mm. Um, thank you so much, uh, Luke. But again, let's find time together next week to look at the insurance uh, sector. It looks like a whole lot of activities are taking place. Perhaps these are related to the uh, recapitalization or consolidation in that industry. Uh, I guess the initial deadline uh, is December. Maybe you see volumes taking place. ICO Insurance, I guess, is briefing the market today. Uh, uh, virtually speaking. So uh, a whole lot of trading as that transactions are going on on a daily basis between the gainers. Look at uh, insurance sector 1.28% yesterday, despite the downside for the rest of the market. So Agzam and Sad give uh, a, a forecast out there. A few of them have also given forecast. So it looks like the insurance space is uh, something to watch within the equity market space in Nigeria. Well, let's leave that for some time next week, uh, Luke. Thank you so much for of being on the program this uh, Friday. Thank you, Luke Ofojebe from uh, Vetiva Capital Management. And Ayudi Jebo was with us earlier, an investment professional. Thank you, everyone. Have a great weekend and see you back next week.